All throughout November, I'm rocking a mustache to help raise awareness and support for Movember. Click the link in the description to find out how you can support cancer research and men's health. If there was one anime that defined Adult Swim back in the day, then it would have to be Cowboy Bebop. For all intents and purposes, you cannot overstate the importance the show held for the block, or for the fandom as a whole. It was a banner held aloft by seemingly everyone who called themselves an otaku, and it would be the benchmark for an entire generation of anime to come. If you really think about it, we're still waiting for the next Bebop to come and blow us all away. While we've had popular shonen shows that have come and gone fulfilling the teenage lust for action left momentarily void by an endless succession of series, there hasn't really been that one singular genre-defining show that anyone of any walk of life could enjoy. Not that we haven't been looking, mind you, but that just goes to show you how special Bebop was. And if I was a betting man, then I'd wager that we'll never find the new Bebop. It's not just because the series was so good, it's because it was the right show at the right time. With anime becoming more and more accessible to people outside of Right Stuff catalogs and Suncoast stores, Bebop was the perfect introduction for people outside the fandom who were curious enough about it. Decidedly anime looking but maintaining a strong foothold in western tropes and other familiar devices, Cowboy Bebop was veritable lightning in a bottle. However, that certainly didn't stop US licensing companies from trying to sell us the new Bebop. And wouldn't you know it, a couple of years down the line, the people behind Cowboy Bebop got together to create a new show, Wolf's Rain. And instant money. Released in Japan in 2003, then here on Adult Swim in 2004, Wolf's Reign seemed like what everyone was looking for after the high of Bebop faded away. Written and created by the same writer of Bebop, Keiko Nobumoto, with updated visuals and a new soundtrack by Yoko Kano, for those who weren't around, there's no way you could have known just how excited we all were to finally get our spiritual successor. And then we got it. And... Hmm... Viewer strongly cautioned. The following contains opinions that might run contrary to yours. If this shocks you, welcome to the internet. Legends state that when the world is coming to an end, the path to paradise will be opened, and wolves will lead the way. Having been relegated to fairy tales and legends by the near extinction of their species, four remaining wolves in people's clothing are led by their intuition toward a maiden born of flowers and the light of the moon. She alone can guide these wolves towards the promised and pure land that lies beyond the ruins of mankind. And perhaps in doing so, the five will bear witness to a new world for humanity, and all other creatures big and small to start over. I don't know if the place we tried to find was real or not, but I believe that there are some that can make it to paradise, and there are some who can't. I'm convinced of that. Right out of the gate, the show does well in establishing the intended tone of the series. A bleak, sobering story where the world is dying a cold and frigid death. And if I'm being honest, yeah, that's my absolute jam. From the outside looking in, I can see why having a love for cold, wet, and grimy settings is a weird sort of personal thing to have, but I can't help but fall in love with the aesthetics of Wolf's Rain and the way it captures these sentiments and feelings. Snow, rain, and dirt have an evocative effect on the viewer, at least in my experience. And a story that can match that cutting and cold feeling one gets by looking outside on a gray, rainy day is something to applaud. In short, there's just something about this kind of setting that speaks to me in a way that no other kind can. So for me personally, Wolf's Rain could not have started off on a better foot. Sure, the premise of the story itself sounds a bit out there, what with the notion of wolves finding paradise by the light of a flower maiden, but the atmosphere and mood cast a sort of structure for the details of the plot to hang and build upon. Details like the wolves' ability to shroud themselves in illusion and disguise themselves as humans. You don't think he's been killed, do you? If anything had happened, I'm sure we would have felt it. Kiba's alive. 
He has to be. While the show itself never really goes into how the wolves have this ability, it's not necessarily out of the realm of established folklore. Wolves have often been associated with deceptiveness and cunning, what with phrases like wolves in sheep's clothing permeating our vocabulary, and stories upon stories of wolves donning disguises to fool naive humans. <coughs> Skinwalkers! <coughs> In a way, Wolf's Reign just takes this notion and stretches it to the next logical step, although a part of me does feel like Keiko Nobumoto might have taken a little inspiration from Jinro, possibly under the influence of a foreign substance. We are not men disguised as mere dogs. We are wolves disguised as men. Dude, like, what if there were wolves disguised as men? Oh my god. That's brilliant! Kidding aside, the premise itself is out there, but not nearly as impenetrably dense as some make it out to be. If you try to take the story of four wolves that sometimes look like wolves and sometimes look like humans running across a barren tundra with a pastel-colored human in tow, trying to find paradise as literal, you're gonna have a bad time. And that's because the anime wants to play coy with its own history and world. Producer Masahiko Minami, who also worked on Bebop, by the way, stated that the world of Wolf's Reign was purposefully built to be reminiscent of our world, what with ties to identifiable real-world cultures and languages, but it was never truly stated or established as our world. Likewise, the extended historical backdrop of the story is littered with half-told legends and other curiously missing details. A lot of the questions that rise over the course of the show are answered, but not necessarily in a clear or lucid way. And then there's the angle of the nobility. Cast as the backdrop of the Four Wolves' journey is the machinations of the remaining ruling class, dubbed simply as the Nobles. Having created the Flower Maiden, Cheza, the Nobles play their part as antagonists, even though the premise of the story acts as the antagonizing force in of itself. In essence, their part in the story feels narratively hollow, but thematically rich. I say hollow because the notion of the Nobles creating Cheza to find their own paradise really strikes an odd chord with the stated legend of wolves finding paradise, because, well, how can a legend born free of human influence still be dependent upon human intervention? Like, how in the world would the wolves find paradise if there is no flower maiden that was made by humans? Or are the nobles even human in the first place? Unanswered questions like these can certainly cause consternation in the literal-minded, but I feel that's not necessarily the intent of their part in the story. When you break down the nobles' motivations and actions, you realize that they both inform the story's fatalistic nature. As the wolves try to pursue paradise, here are the nobles ostensibly rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Heads of states are assassinated, coups are carried out, also that one city-state might be the top of the bombed-out, lifeless world that, in the end, they're just going to throw away anyway and move on to the next world with their own paradise. What's the point? Orkham and Darsha are both gone. Yes, I know. But everybody has their own way of surviving, and this happens to be mine. When Wolf's Reign is at its best, it's when it's delving deep into these seemingly hopeless story avenues, letting the viewer be overcome with a sense of beautiful grief. Make no mistake, you have to be in a mood to want to watch something like Wolf's Reign, because it can sap the joy and life out of anyone who watches. But that also makes the few moments in the story that are warm and comforting have that much more impact. After all, when you've been freezing in the cold for hours on end, even a match's flame can feel like the hearth of home. <laughs> However, when Wolf's Reign is at its weakest, it can be pretty annoying and senseless. Anime event will return in a moment. I'm not tracking them for pleasure or curiosity, you know. It's for revenge. Anime event now continues. Up until now, I have been talking about the story in a very broad sense, and that's not just because I want to avoid spoiling as much as I can, but also because the story benefits from looking at it from a distance, as it were. Wolf's Reign is a moody, atmospheric piece, with its story acting as a mere vehicle to move from sobering emotion to sobering emotion. But if we take a more granular look at the story, we can start to see cracks in the foundation, starting with the four main characters. 
Kiba, Tsume, Hige, and Toboe, our four wolves seeking paradise, are the driving force of the story. But sadly, the story being driven is bigger than the characters themselves, which relegates them to being tragically flat and too one note to be engaging. What's the point of living if it means throwing away your pride? You got a big mouth for someone half dead. That's right, we're circling back to one of our favorite tropes of all time. Pretty bulls with problems! Yeah! Individually speaking, the four characters each have their own annoyances, and that would be bad enough, but because they're supposed to be playing off of each other and letting the plot and story develop them along the way, their lack of any real strong or varied characterization winds up only compounding the annoyances. Starting with easily the most annoying of the four, Toboe. What are you so mad about, huh? Come on, come back and join us, okay? Shut the hell up! You know it's dangerous to move around alone. It doesn't matter, does it? We're always alone. <laughs> oh, goody, another mealy mouth whoopee that just drags down the plot. Sure do love that old chestnut. As the runt of the group, Toboe plays the put-upon little brother to the other three, which in of itself isn't a bad thing. But by the time we reach the halfway point of the series, his insisting on butting into other people's business while only contributing empty platitudes of Come on guys, we gotta work together! makes him this obnoxious little chump that really only gets in the way. Who the hell died and made you the leader, huh? Neither one of us is the leader, Hige. Ours just isn't the kind of pack that has one. What kind of pack are we then? Guys, come on, that doesn't really matter, right? And while the story tries to give him an arc where he learns to prove himself as a worthy member of the pack, it comes out of nowhere and is quickly forgotten about. But we'll get back to that in due time. While Toboe is the most annoying of the four, he has stiff competition in the Sundere Tsume. What were you up to last night? I know you didn't get all those wounds at the station. Not like I care or anything. It's not like I like you or anything. Baka. The more I think about Sume, the more I'm actually kind of pissed at him in his place in the story. He isn't just a Sundere, he's a stereotypical Sundere. And just like with Toboe, his arc of becoming more open and cooperative is rushed, comes out of nowhere, and is quickly forgotten. In fact, it's even worse because it doesn't even factor into the story of the episode at all. He just relates his backstory completely unprompted and imparts why he has a hard time fitting in with other wolves. But by the time he comes clean about it, it's the penultimate episode. The time for his arc to complete itself had already long since passed, especially within the apocalyptic setting that we have at the end. So what we wind up getting are these completely empty moments where they attempt to have some kind of deep emotional resonance. Simply put, the anime didn't earn this. And speaking of not earning anything, the lead of our story, Kiba, certainly doesn't deserve the spotlight that comes with the distinction. Hey, I know. When we all finally make it out of here, what's the very first thing you want to do? Eat and sleep. Kiba is, for all intents and purposes, purely a device for the story. He's just a goddamn tool by all definitions of the word. While Toboe and Sume are annoying in their personalities, you can make the argument that they have personalities. Kiba doesn't even have that much. He's just destined to find Cheza in paradise. That's it. He's just the special. No real reason given as to why he's the special. He just is. And the audience is expected to gravitate towards him because of it. Don't you believe in paradise too? I'm not going. No way. All right. See you around. Hey, Kiba! Try to give a guy advice and what does it get you? I seriously tried to rack my brain coming up with adjectives and descriptors I could use for Kiba that weren't just shades of, he's the protagonist, and the only word I could come up with is driven. And even then, the story still finds a way to hamstring him. Where exactly are we headed? To paradise. And just what in the hell is guiding you there? I'm going on instinct. All throughout the series, his main motivating factor of finding Cheza in paradise consumes him. But it isn't because of his own personal beliefs or morals. He's just following instincts, which completely strips him of any sense of agency. If he's being compelled to seek Cheza in paradise, then that removes his intent as a character, let alone a protagonist. And that makes him a massive, massive tool. Scenes that are supposed to depict his otherworldly gumption and grit are kneecapped by the story not letting him be driven for his own sake. The only... The only one of the four that I find to be even remotely engaging is Hige. And even then, it's still kind of touch and go. You're living a lie. Just so you can die a miserable death in this city? 
Gotta do what you can to survive, right? Keep looking like that, you'll be back here in no time. A seemingly free-spirited doofus, Hige has far more to him than either of the other three, and his arc actually matters to the plot at large as well. I won't go much further into it, seeing as how it ties heavily to some massive spoilers, but his place in the story reaches a bit further than just being the light-hearted comic relief. I need you to wait here. No, Hige, don't leave me behind. I won't. Please, Blue. If I know you're waiting for me, I'll make it back no matter what. It's the only thing that can get me through this. However, I do not want to gloss over the fact that our main characters are just shallow dinguses that are constantly being led by the nose by the plot, because, lest we forget, this is Keiko Nobumoto we're talking about here. It's actually pretty frustrating that our leads are written like this, because the supporting cast is some of the strongest in Nobumoto's filmography. When the story is firing on all cylinders, it's when the supporting human characters are driving the plot, led by standouts Quint Yadin and Hub... Lebowski. Nobody calls me Lebowski. You got the wrong guy. I'm the dude. <laughs> Your name's Lebowski, Lebowski. And the reason why they work so well is because they have, shocker of shocks, agency. Quint is just as driven as Kiba, but his drive stems from the tragedy he suffered and that his sworn vengeance on wolves is really the only thing keeping him going. Always helps to have a friend when you're crossing the mountains. Never know what you might run into. Like bears. Or wolves. And, well, the relationship he shares with Blue, his family's dog that also happens to be part wolf, is just endearing as all get out. I'll admit that most of the appeal lies in the fact that it's just an old man and his dog, and that kind of camaraderie comes with it a whole host of innate pathos, but damn it, it works, and if you're not moved by his and her story, then you have a missing heart to go and find. Likewise, Hub has his own relationships that drive him and his actions specifically revolving around his estranged wife, Cher. As a detective trying to solve her disappearance, Hub plays the in-way-over-his-head audience proxy that allows the story to trickle in details of the setting and the politics thereof. His journey is necessary not only as a means to let the audience know what in the world is going on, but also necessary from a thematic standpoint. He and Cher are where the important human element crosses with the out-there, despondent story. I'm here, together with you. Something that I'd almost given up hope on has come true. Whatever happens to the world, Cher, I want to have faith in the future. You really have changed. The hell that Cher and Hub had to go through to reunite plays extremely well into the hand of the apocalyptic setting, giving the audience a sense of necessary hope in completely desperate times. Not to say that Hub is a vibrantly realized character, he does play the everyman role to a T after all, or that Cher herself isn't also a veritable leaf being blown around by the whims of the plot, but together their arc gives an emotional core that the story desperately needed. But doesn't it seem weird that Wolf's Reign needed this emotional core to its story so badly? Why does it seem that its story doesn't work nearly as well as Bebop's? All the pieces seem to be there. The same head writer, the same producer, the same character designer, the same composer, and yet Wolf's Ring keeps missing the mark when compared to its predecessor. Well, there is one guy who didn't come back. The director, Shinichiro Watanabe. There's nothing left now. Where are the two of us supposed to go, Cher? Anime abandon will return in a moment. Anime abandon now continues. If you remember correctly, Shinichiro Watanabe did not return to direct Wolf's Reign, instead electing to work on a new series with a mostly new team, Samurai Champloo. Hey! Look, there's a naked woman over there! Huh? <laughs> Now, it's easy to just point fingers and say that Watanabe directed Bebop and that's why Wolf's Reign isn't nearly as good, but I think what we have here is actually a perfect example of what an anime director actually does in an anime. If we use Bebop as a starting point, then use Champloo and Wolf's Reign to contrast with each other, we can start to delineate who contributed what to where. Since we know that Wolf's Reign was Nobumoto's project, proved by the fact that she is given top billing along with Studio Bones, we can tell she had quite the pull on creative decisions, and those decisions are reflected by certain moments and scenes in Bebop. It doesn't take much to correlate the episodes that Nobumoto wrote with Wolf's Reign because there is quite a lot of overlap. 
cold grimy settings characters peeling off on their own dour and subdued antagonists that speak poetically and enigmatically you have any idea what you look like right at this moment spike what a ravenous beast the same blood runs through both of us the blood of a beast who wanders hunting for the blood of others there are wolves and there are creatures that were created from them not all humans were born from the wolf there are also those who began their existence as wolves, but they abandoned their true form. However, while these scenes are from the most beloved episodes of Bebop's run, they're not necessarily known for their character work, or their dialogue for that matter. What we remember from these episodes, in particular, are the scenes where much isn't being said, when the music is allowed to breathe and inform the emotion the audience should be feeling. Who among us wasn't moved by Spike being thrown from the stained glass window as Greenberg played his descent? Who didn't shed a tear when Spike led Gren and his ship back to Titan as Space Lion echoed its haunting melody? And that's when you realize... Where are these moments in Wolf's Reign? Oh, don't get me wrong, this is Yoko Kano's music we're talking about here, and she is at her usual best in Wolf's Reign. But when you think about the Wolf's Reign soundtrack, however beautiful it might be, the show itself is missing those all-too-important moments where the music and visuals are synced perfectly. Whereas, if you look at Samurai Champloo, there are plenty of scenes where the audio and the visual mesh wonderfully. From Mugen's near-death experience, the fight with Shoryu, the stare-down with Koza, Champloo is brimming with unique and striking scenes that were made by the music just as much as the visuals. <laughs> Normally, having these kinds of scenes wouldn't make or break an anime, but when you're trying to create a moody, atmospheric anime like Wolf's Reign, the ability for the audio and the picture to play together is all important. What's worse is that the anime doesn't really use its music in any real, meaningful way. Too many times, Yoko Kano's music is just played in the background while the characters are talking over it, thereby crushing the mood of both the dialogue and the music. <laughs> You know, we've wasted a hell of a lot of time because of you. The others have gone off to look for food. And that's if the music and the scene in question share an emotional throughline, because too many times in Wolf's Reign, there is no common ground at all. You really do miss Watanabe's directorial flair in these moments, and the hired gun director that Bones got for Wolf's Reign just doesn't cut the mustard. Who directed this anyway? Tensai Okamura. Looks like he's mostly a storyboard artist who did work on Bebop, no surprise there, and directed Dark in the Black, Blue Exorcist, and Android Key Kiter. <laughs> now you understand. This is your true form. It can't be. That actually explains a lot. And it's not just that the uninspired use of its music is what causes most of the atmospheric moments to fall flat, because for a moody and somber anime, Wolf's Reign sure likes to have a lot of goofy shit happen. Remember how I said that Toboe's arc just comes in out of nowhere? Well... Toboe has been harboring feelings that he's weighing everyone down and that he's useless to the other three, which he is, but he decides to prove himself to the pack by going all out and taking out a GIGANTIC WALRUS! <laughs> and the hell of it is that he does it! And then all four wolves eat the walrus. Holy hell, and they strip him clean too, like they were a colony of ants on a grasshopper. How in the world did these four wolves eat all that walrus meat without looking like the furry version of Mr. Creosote? And that is far from the only time the anime goes into weird silly territory that just absolutely spoils the mood. How about here, where Kiba and company protect Cheza from a colony of giant roly polies? Already time one of the characters suddenly talks to another animal. You've got what it takes to get to paradise. And then some. Thanks a lot. 
<laughs> Look, I know that they're wolves, so it's not necessarily out of the realm of possibility that other animals could talk to, but it happens so sporadically and so rarely that it feels like the anime is giving me a wet willy while also giving a eulogy. I'll admit that Wolf's Reign, much like Samurai Champloo, had an uphill battle to fight because how in the world is any show supposed to follow Bebop? and that a lot of what detracts from it is from the inevitable comparisons to Bebop. But is it unfair to judge the show this way, especially when it's firmly established that both shows share no narrative connection to each other? Well, I won't say it's fair, but I will say that it's only natural. Considering human nature's habit to compare and contrast, that many people from Bebop also worked on Wolf's Reign only lends itself to those comparisons. We judge writers, directors, actors, nearly every artist alive and dead by what they have done previously all the time. And in some contexts, particularly historical contexts, it's actually vital that we do so. We can fight against such predilections, sure, but to what end? That every piece of art, regardless of who made it and when, should be separated from all context and viewed solely within a void where only it exists? Well, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Art is not made nor experienced in a vacuum. You can't willingly forget that a lot of people who worked on Bebop also worked on Wolf's Reign. Nor should you. You would have to make a conscious effort to try and separate yourself and Wolf's Reign within the context that Bebop, Adult Swim, Bondi's marketing, and even you yourself created. It might not be fair, but then again, what things in life are. So with all of that said, where do I come down on Wolf's Reign? Well... I want to like the gorgeous animation and character design, I want to like its setting and atmosphere that drips with mood and beautiful sadness, and I want to like the experience that it gave me. But at the end of the day, there is too much working against it. The main characters are unengaging and the plot runs roughshod over their development to the point where arcs come and go without much fanfare, the sleepwalking direction robs it of the necessary gravity and power that the show should have had, and, well, it just can't escape Bebop's shadow. Still, the fact that I want to like it must count for something. So, at the end of the day, I guess I'll leave it at that. I wanted to like it. Well, Adult Swim month has come, and it is gone. But we can't be sad about it for too long, because guess what? Next month is the most wonderful time of the year. That's right, everybody. Gundam Sember is back. And we are kicking things off by asking the all-too-important question of... What would happen if Vietnam had Gundams in it? Till next time. <laughs>